All right, welcome back. Yes, indeed, uh, some focus on Edo elections, uh, some appraisal. We look at the conduct, the performance, and some of the other attendance matters, as it were. So, uh, Bishop Matthew Cooker joins us this morning, the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, remember? Also a member of the National Peace Committee. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning, Chairman. Well, really thank you the, very much. Uh, your team. All right, then. For, from, from your position, having seen how all of this turned out, what do you think is the key or are the key components that culminated in how this turned out the way it did? I'm talking broadly now. Well, I mean, if you are speaking broadly, uh, first of all, thank you very much and congratulations to the good people of Edo State and by extension, the people of Nigeria. Um, there isn't a single key. There are actually multiple keys that can unlock this door. And I think that is the good news. Um, generally, I think that uh, the institutions we related with, INEC, uh, the security agencies in particular, the police, uh, civil society groups uh, actually did optimally well. Um, we work very closely with INEC, and I must singularly commend the INEC chairman for his incredible leadership, zeal, and enthusiasm, and their efficiency, because we saw that at very close quarters. Um, there are other institutions that were deployed. The Inspector General of Police, I think, kept to his word the promises he made to the people of Edo State and to the Peace Committee um, all those were, were very, very efficiently carried out, as we see from the nature of the, uh, of the elections themselves and how they were concluded. So I think going forward, uh, our commendation goes to the people of Edo State. Uh, I've received quite a lot of messages from old friends in Edo State that I haven't spoken to in a long time, uh, commending the work of the Peace Committee. But really, this is not an honor that one in, in individual or institution should take. It is the people of Edo State, the contestants themselves, the way they conducted themselves. And um, I think in every sense of the word, they left us a, a, a legacy of efficiency. And I think we commend the people of Edo State, uh, as I said, and the contestants and the electorate for the way they conducted themselves. Well, talking about that, what is different uh, in terms of the way the people conducted themselves from the way some other elections, I mean, Oshun, for instance, and some other states who will say that we conducted ourselves as best as we could, but certain other extraneous factors perhaps made things turn out the way they did. Thank you. That's an excellent question, and it's also an excellent observation. First, uh, you know, the people, the ordinary people of Nigeria have no reflexes for violence. Um, violence is always externally imposed on our people by external agents, uh, politicians whose ambitions remain unrestrained, um, the overbearing and overarching attitude of the state itself, um, and its willingness and, and, and disposition towards deploying all the agencies of violence to enforce their will. Uh, Ocean State is a horribly bad case, you know, uh, in the sense that I think it's not something that the international community, Nigerians themselves, and I think even a good number of the people of Ocean will just want to put behind them. Uh, but we are happy. We have, I think that every Nigerian should be grateful that somehow there is a measurable and a qualitative improvement um, in the you know in terms of the way that the state itself deployed or didn't deploy violence instruments of violence. Uh, so even though the idea of sending 30,000 30, or so policemen to a state generated a lot of anxiety. But when the police broke it down to saying that there will be three policemen in, in, in every polling booth, I think people felt quite relaxed. So, in, you know, the, the reality is that this game has rules. The voters try to, and I think they sufficiently understand the rules. The participants also do try to understand the rules. The most important thing is that very often, as I said, the agencies of the, I mean, the agents of the state, in particular, sitting governors often tend to want to manufacture consent at all costs. And I think in fairness, the contestants in Edo State were sufficiently restrained. They stuck to the, to, you know, to the rules of engagement. Uh, whatever may have happened was not, I mean, overtly discernible to the rest of us. But I think in fairness, we can say that what we saw in Edo State is also an expression of 
the nature of the conduct of incumbents and how all that impacts on ordinary citizens. So we, I hope that we are witnessing the, 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 the withdrawal of an overbearing state which always seeks to impose its will. Because it is always when the will of the state is in opposition to the will of ordinary people, those are the issues that trigger and spark of violence. So we can only encourage our people and encourage all the actors, you know, to ensure that everybody understands the rules of the game. Uh, and those who are participating also sufficiently appreciate the fact that, you know, uh, like, I, like I often say, it's only the living, you know, that can have, you know, the, you know participate in the next election and also reap the benefits of, uh, of democracy. You've spoken a lot about the leadership at various levels. You've spoken about the police, the INEC, the incumbents, and all of that. But from taking from the Chamberlain, the question Chamberlain just asked you, it's about the people now. How far reaching would you say what happened in Edo State among the people? How do you think we can carry that or situate it among other states as well? Because, yes. The terrains are usually different. Edo is different from Ondo and Sokoto and the rest of them. But how do you think we can circulate this same, com communicate this same thing so that we can have the same experience all over the place? Because what we had, the experience we had in Edo, if we have the same in other states, definitely the general elections will be largely peaceful. Is there any way you think we can do that? Well, I think there is a point to be made for what is called in political science, political culture. You know, and we're witnessing, and I think that, and I, permit me for, you know, please pardon me for saying this. Frankly, ordinary people have learned far more than the politicians themselves. A lot of the politicians have read from the wrong textbook, and they've always read from the textbook that encouraging all, encourages all the bad things about elections and electoral processes. So if you develop a political culture, and, and for us in a diverse environment such as the one we have, it has to be an aggregate of cultures. So for example, I saw very clearly the way the people of, 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 of Edo revered you know, they, you know, the sense of respect that they give to the Oba, for example. And I think that INEC and the Peace Committee were able to harvest that, you know, moral authority, as you saw from our visit to the Oba, the visit of INEC to the Oba, he's using, deploying that authority to summon the contestants, you know, and to speak to them in a way or manner that I think created a condition for people to learn to behave. So when we have those kind of institutions, that are respected. The problem is how the leaders or holders of those institutions deploy their moral authority. If they trade it off, if they batter it off, then it has consequences on how people behave. The second point is that, you know, there are too many political actors that are coming into the game with, this, with the spirit and manner that has absolutely nothing to do with the principles of democracy. Just like any other game, it's a sport, and not everybody can win, and you only win by playing according to the rules. So I think we need to see very massively, uh, beyond just tribunals, we need to see very massively an aggressive uh, uh, you know, approach towards punishing you know, people who behave badly, especially political actors. Unfortunately, INEC has continued to complain about its, you know, its in seeming inability to deal with some of the you know, electoral offenses that they experience every day. Uh, but I think by and large, uh, good elections encourage people. Uh, and I, I, you know, like I said at the beginning, you, I think if you are a citizen of Edo State, you will be walking very tall and feeling very proud. And I think this is the knock-on effect that good conduct you know, has on other people. In the same way that when people behave badly, it has tremendous impact on the community. We are still a very largely community-based you know, society. So this is why it is important that the people of Edo have, you know, by conducting themselves in the way and manner that they have, they've conferred respectability on the process. And our prayer and hope is that it will be expected that Governor Baseki, who has won the election, must pay back the ordinary people of Edo State, uh, not as a miracle worker, but, but by keeping to his promises and building on this harmony. And I think that if we continue in this way, what we will see is that our elections will be less violent um, because the violence is also induced by the feeling of total helplessness of ordinary citizens, that there are consequences with losing elections.
there are severe consequences. Those consequences include the fact that the governor can ignore your community. The governor will make sure you don't have a school. The governor will make sure your children don't get promoted, and so on and so forth. So this is why people take this as a zero-sum game. So if political actors and beneficiaries don't behave well, it has impact on how the process plays out. Well, you, you've talked about some consequences there. I'm sure we'll get to that. But then your reference to the Oba of Benin uh, and his role, so to speak, the reverence with which people hold him in the city and in the state, perhaps is acting in a way to the call by the Senate president for some adjustments or amendments to factor in traditional rulers in our polity. Do you think that is something that can be replicated all over the nation to have some form of constitutional role for traditional rulers? Uh, you know, this is not, I mean, uh, from the point of view, from the political science part of it, uh, it's doubtful whether democracy can coexist with feudalism. Um, this is the theoretical aspect. We are in a practical situation. I think that the temptations are huge uh, for, for, for traditional rulers to seek a role for themselves. But I think that also traditional rulers must come to terms with the consequences of embracing Caesar because the consequences are huge. And it is not enough, you know, to say that all the actors are within my domain and so on. They may, they may, they may not necessarily be of the same ethnicity. They may not be of the same religion. Um, history teaches us very clearly, and if I'm a Catholic priest, so I can talk about this eloquently. Very few institutions have had the experience that the Catholic Church has had, and appreciating the consequences of embracing Caesar. So it might be tempting, you know, to say that uh, a role needs to be found. But every, every traditional ruler must also be ready to live with the consequences of a governor who does not agree with him. We have seen it in history. So it depends on whether the institutions want to be tempted, you know, by the, by the filthy look of power, or whether they feel confident enough to preserve their moral authority and deploy it when necessary. Because guess what? Ask yourself the question, what is it that traditional rulers need to do now that they cannot do? Uh, if it is about having a place in Abuja or, or coming for meetings in Abuja, they must live with the consequences that a new political, a new president who is not from the ruling party will think, will act completely differently from the expectations of the person, you know, who has been there before. We've, you know, we've seen a lot of this. So if you ask me, my position quite simply is that like the church, um, we must be careful, you know, because Caesar's crown seems to have too many thumbs. So, but it depends. I, personally, I think that uh, we're in a democracy and we should be inching closer and closer to a culture of common citizenship, uh, which somehow ro royalty also, and like I've said somewhere, you know, that we are citizens in Abuja, we go back to our communities and we become subjects. Now, you cannot have citizens and subjects cohabiting in a democracy. So democracy is about common citizenship. It's about creating an egalitarian society where all of us have freedom to aspire to what we want to be. So I think, as I said, the temptation is very is there. But traditional rulers must be careful because the politicians seek extra mileage. And if this is what sounds like will give them votes, they will tell you that. Um, but as I said, personally, as far as I'm concerned, I think that... Uh, it is something that we, it's a field we must trade with tremendous caution, and it must be subjected to greater interrogation. Speaking of common citizenship and entrenching democracy, you touched on a consequence, well, a possible consequence, and that's the possibility of some areas being neglected, maybe because they didn't vote for the winner uh, in the election. And I'm thinking, is there a way to forestall that? Because I don't think that is fair, really. Exactly what we are practicing in Nigeria, in it, you know, I mean, it's just theoretically, we answer the name of democracy, but in reality, what we are dealing with is a semi feudal uh, system that is tied to agencies and ideologies that have got nothing to do with democracy. Um, when last did you see a politician across Europe, which we are trying to imitate? go and bow to the queen or bow to the king or seek blessing from a bishop or seek blessing from, you know. So we, you know, we have too many intervening variables that are confusing the narrative. Essentially, essentially, uh, like Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government. 
except for others, because others have been tried, you know, and found wanting. So the point is that any society, and so a measure of the fact that we're really not practicing the principles of democracy lies in the fact that, you know, only those who have money can hope to be voted into power. Now, this is not in keeping with the principles of democracy. If that was what you wanted, you could be practicing a system of government that is called plutocracy. You know, it, it is felt that only people who are anointed should be able to, either you are anointed by, 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 by some, some superior force or otherwise. If that is the case, then we should be practicing feudalism. There are many options. There are people, if you feel you need to be anointed to, to ascend to power, then we, we, you know, we are not in a theocracy. So other systems have been tried and tested. We have found democracy the most viable platform for managing a diverse society. But, and to answer your question, we are seeing this glaringly every day. There are governors that have decided to boycott, you know, constituencies that voted for them on grounds that they just don't feel comfortable after they've collected their votes. Um, there, are, there, are, there are communities that can visibly see the measurable changes in the lives, opportunities, and fortunes of those who either worship with the person who is in power or they are from the same ethnic community with the person who is in power. Unfortunately, our people are so incapacitated. The structures are so heavily weighed against our people. We're coming from a backdrop of, of you know, double jeopardy. One, we came from a, we're, we're, we're inheritors of a colonial state. Two, we're also inheritors of a military state that actually performed far badly, far worse than, than, than the colonial state. So these are the heavy burdens that Nigerians are carrying. And the beneficiaries of this system have still not found it in their mind, you know, opportunities to become democratic. So you still find that there are residual tendencies of militarism and tyranny manifesting themselves in the way that once people are elected, you cannot go near them, in the way that some governors con you know, conduct themselves, in the way that public officers conduct themselves. So you don't see any sign that people really matter before, beyond being conveyor belts for the ambition of the person in power. And once they've collected your votes, it's goodbye until we do the next election. You know, so for me, creating an egalitarian society is a long-term project, but our people must begin to teach us that our investments are worthwhile. Again, because all this has a wide impact on democratic conduct. If people see the benefits, the measurable benefits from their, from their sweat, they will be the primary investors in, the, you know, in this democracy. But if people turn the apparatus, the opportunities available to them, and they turn the state into a distribution agency in which they give to whom they want, it has consequences because those who are not Christians or not Muslims, those who are not of your ethnic group, are frustrated. And that is why the next time they will say, we want our man in at all costs or our woman in at all costs. And guess what? Our man and our woman still come in and they leave us in tears because our communities still don't end up being better. So for me, these are the issues. And uh, every election should give us an opportunity you know, to subject them to interrogation. Oh, you, you did uh, allude to the role of the West at some point. Now, people are already hypothesizing. Having talked about the visa ban, how people needed to conduct themselves, they wouldn't come to this country if certain things happen, those who have been restricted. And so they thought, who knows, is this a feature that you know, other countries should jump onto and ensure that leaders here are held accountable based on some of these other factors? And they think, if this had happened before, say, Kogi elections, would they have made any major difference in the way the elections turned out, the conduct of the elections? Look, I, I mean, the international community can take its decisions about visa ban, but visa bans don't put bread on my table. Okay, so they have really no consequence to me. They don't make my ticket cheaper. I may have a visa. I'm not in a hurry to travel to anybody's country. My concern and my worry is the debility condition under which Nigerians are living. Now, don't forget, all this talk about visa ban, you, know, you are not going to ban the electronic transfer of huge resources that are moving out of this country. I don't hear if there is a ban on that. That would probably be more meaningful, you know, because it will domesticate the resources and we can build homes, you know, and give, you know, and give our children jobs. Uh, so these, these things are largely symbolic. They are largely cosmetic. But let's also be fair to ourselves. The Americans didn't come here to vote. We are the ones who voted. And 
even though I'm a priest, I'm always quick to tell people, please don't summon God to judgment because God didn't vote in this election. We are the ones who voted. So be first, of, first of all, be answerable to us. I think that what we should also begin to learn to do is to simply go back to our own cultures and our own history. We also had a sense of shame and how people who did bad things were punished in the communities. So frankly, rather than being excited about visa bans, I would rather suggest, you know, that we go back and begin to think among ourselves about the best way to, let me use the word, either humiliate or impose a certain level of psychological torture on people who are not doing well. Okay, and, and you know, like I said, in, in Hausa traditional culture, for example, I mean, if you, if you were caught as a thief, they put you on a donkey, but you were facing the, you know, the opposite direction. There were songs that were sung for people who did bad things. So it, for me, we commend the international community, but I think we must domesticate our responsibility and figure out, I hear Nigerians talk all the time about, you know, people with, you know, uh, who have conducted, who have not conducted themselves well. But it is the same Nigerians who still line up behind, you know, these same people. So I think that if we develop an attitude in Europe, for example, you know, in, in, in Britain, if if you if a politician behaves badly, you know, people throw eggs at the pelted eggs at them. I'm not saying you should stone anybody, but I'm just saying on our own, we can devise peaceful mechanism, whether it is through protest. Because unfortunately, this is a country that is not using the you know the streets. After you've cast your vote, the most viable place to be which civil society must occupy, which Nigerians must occupy, which everybody must occupy are the streets. You can see what is happening in Belarus. You can see what happened in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong. You can see what is happening in other places. So when people get a sense, if politicians get a sense that their bad behavior will not be rewarded with, with, with complacency, they'll be forced to behave. So for me, I we need to take a look at the role of the umpire. That's huge. Now, in 20, uh, when Jaga conducted the last elections, uh, before, when he left, people commended that process. But thereafter, then there were questions. Today, people talk about what INEC deployed, how it turned out. What should we then turn have as the gold standard? Should we then say, look, National Assembly, having seen the way this has gone, we need to ensure we have electronic voting? Or should, is INEC going to continue? this way moving forward what's a guarantee that what you see today you may not see that tomorrow you know let me let me let me let me use a football metaphor you know i i'm a national supporter and i believe i hope you are you know i say i say you know but they people who, who criticize arsenal say they go at playing they play very good football you know but the results always turn out differently now, if you stick with Jega himself, Professor Jega himself, only last week, he and Cardinal Onaika and a few people issued a statement, you know, stating their dissatisfaction with the way things are in the country today. That raises a fundamental question of the correlation between process and outcomes. So it is possible to have the most peaceful elections, such as the ones that brought Hitler to power, uh, but then the outcome is completely different. So in the final analysis, yes, I think peaceful elections are desirable and we must aspire and we must work towards them. But again, the ball still falls on the court of the politician. When they have collected this prize, what do they do with it? That is the question. So, and I think we, 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 we because if people get a sense, for example, that the government, we're not expecting, you know, magicians. People will have, will, 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 will have failures. They will make mistakes. But you can tell if there is a difference between what the heart thinks and what the head is doing. So if you get a sense that a good man is probably doing bad things, it can be corrected. But the, vi the visible malfeasance that we see as a political outcome does not encourage democracy. So you may have a system in which you produce... We, you know, pardon me, we, we need to go to break, but... We'll come back to you so you can continue your thoughts in just a moment. And I hope Arsenal fans can have something to share. Stay with, stay with us. All right, welcome back to Sunrise Daily. Go ahead. Well, uh, Bishop, you were talking about the process and the outcome with that analogy. 
uh, that football analogy uh, about Arsenal. But, you know, elections are different. That, that's, that's what you hear political actors and even the umpires say. The terrains are different. We're looking forward to Ondo elections uh, in the coming days. And I'm thinking, yes, we've talked about the people. Maybe we'll touch on that further. We've talked about the institutions. But still on that process, from INEX perspective, what was different uh, about this election and what can we carry over to that Ondo election? I think it is clear that, you know, from the report given by civil society groups, that INEC has developed, improved the quality of its template. Now, if you take that template, it may not necessarily matter, of course, I mean, you know, uh, what the template is. But if you take it to a, an environment, it will depend on how that environment Again, this is why what they do, what has happened in the do is, is good news. And I'm sure that it is going to put pressure on, on, on Ondo because I was quite disappointed, you know, to see the outbreak of violence in Ondo because hitherto the people of Ondo had conducted themselves, you know, and I am in a very, in a very, very in, in, in a, you know, respectable manner. I'm hopeful that what happened uh, last week is just, uh, you know, a, a sad episode. But once you, if, if you have a situation in which one, one, one group or one institution has behaved well. Uh, then you'll have institutions literally involved in a peer, peer review. You know? So it is incumbent on the people of Ondo to now ask themselves, why can we not do better than what happened in, uh, in, 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 in Edo State? And if you have that kind of a culture and people are improving and improving the quality of their own conduct and behavior, and we are competing with one another, that, that is how the system is going to you know, continue to improve until we get to a point in which the bad boys and the bad states can be isolated and can be identified. You know, because if you are not, if you are not, uh, if there is no reward for those who have passed the examination, there can be no punishment for those who have failed. You know, so I think that, uh, you know, it is on this note that we must appreciate the fact that hopefully and prayerfully, the security agencies will conduct themselves in the way and manner that they conducted themselves in Edo. The political actors will conduct themselves in the way that you know things things, things uh, we are done in 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 in, in Edo. and I think that INE will in its own way replicate you know the same template, you know. But again, like I said, the outcomes are important. For example, I mean, I, I I'm rather I saw during your newspaper review the fact that the Kaduna State Government has just declared a three-day uh, a holiday. You know, this is after the ABI himself has already been buried. And I, you know, this is this, you know, this is COVID period. And what I mean here is that people are struggling to make use of every single hour and every single opportunity that is available to them. So to now say that you are freezing three good days, you know, for people to to you know to mourn uh, in a way and manner that even the, the, the person that is being mourned, for example, would probably never have expected, you know, a thing of this nature. So this measurable waste of time you know, has impact, as I said, on how people conduct themselves and how processes and outcomes, you know, determine the way people behave. So the, really the point I'm making is that the, gov the governors and those into whose hands uh, the responsibility has been entrusted must make use of these opportunities very well. See the amount of resources that are deployed to funerals, weddings of the children of governors, young people who have contributed next to almost nothing in Nigeria. You know, so this misuse of resources, if people see that their resources are being used well, they are not expecting paradise. As I said, they will want to extend their good life and invest in democracy if they see that there is a measurable change in their life as a result of these processes. You've spoken about something that I think is very, very interesting. You've talked about pres the preparation for the elections, the process of the elections, and the product of the elections, which is the outcome of the results, as we say. And most of the time, the issues that arise are before and during the elections. And there have been talks over and over again about how we need to uh, have electoral reforms to make sure that we do not have uh, violent elections and all of that, electoral offenses commission and the rest of them. All of that has not happened as much as we would want, yet we had this kind of process in Edo State. So given what we have now, and the results that we had in Edo State. Do you think it is something that can be transmuted 
to the national level as is, the people, the political class, the institutions, INEC, police, and the rest of them? Uh, or you think there, we, there is still very serious need for those uh, reforms to take place? Well, I think, you know, happily, I was a member of the, of, of the, of the Electoral Reform Committee, chaired by Justice Ways, uh, along with Professor Jega himself. You know, our, our disappointment was the fact, was based on the fact that somehow, uh, after all this was done, um, President Jonathan, who, who benefited from this and was also part of, of the process of seeking political reform, by didn't do much in terms of trying to change all these rules. Now, part of the problem is that, you see, the political class is often looking for windows that can be exploited. Uh, and they're not going to be very quick to accept what will limit their opportunities of victory, even if it is for the common good. And this is why you've been having such tremendous difficulties with political uh, reform, electoral reform. I think people generally know what needs to be done, but we've developed such a culture of bad behavior and benefiting from bad behavior and malfeasance and manipulation of the system that we are very, very much averse, you know, to things that even though they will justify the best for the many, I mean, you know, for the majority, the actors are always very slow, you know, to effect these changes, except for General, uh, sorry, except for uh, President Yaradua, who had the courage, you know, to say, listen, I benefited from a flawed system. And I'm putting in place a machinery for dealing with these issues. I think President Buhari needs to be commended, you know, in the sense that at least he has not behaved like some of his predecessors, who would not have just sat down in Abuja and waited for this outcome. Um, I think he, he probably has not been too overbearing in predetermining electoral outcomes, uh, which is more or less within the power of, the, of, of those in, 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 in authority. And I think perhaps civil society must be commended and the media for the pushback that people, you know, saw, you know, after Ocean. So it, it also helps us to appreciate the fact that our voices matter. We must continue to talk. Civil society must continue to do its job, engaging the process, and that there are no finished outcomes, no matter how long we've been on this road. There will always be consequences. Look at what is happening in the United States of America. Look at what is happening, if, you know, everywhere in Europe. So the rules are never final. You know, even God's commandments that are final, are still, we, you know, we are still unable to manage them. So this process, must be, this volatility must be built into the process. And we must continue the, cost, the contestation, hoping that the system will continue to undergo renewal and that the next election will be better than the elections before and the elections after will be better than the elections before. It's when you continue like that, hopefully a generation after us will be able to go to vote and go back home without any anxiety that a woman who has decided she's not going to vote will know that her husband or her son who has gone out to vote is going to come back for lunch. You know, so this cloud of uncertainty is also impacting on, on voter behavior. You know, if people get a, don't get a sense that they, are, um, that, they, you know, that they are secure, they're not going to go out to vote. Now, that's what people want to see moving forward. The next elections better than this particular one. The president then signed some of those amendments several times because he, had, uh, he raised some concerns about some of them. Now, people just say, look, it's just about time that the National Assembly have got to ensure that they attend to that speedily to allow the president to sign it. He's not seeking another term. So we have to sign it so that we can get electronic voting because if INEC has taken this step, we only need to encourage a more robust process. Isn't that the way to go? Yeah, well, I don't like the expression you use that president is not seeking another term, uh, which also, it, it has a lot of resonance, but it speaks to the problem. Oh. That as long as there is a benefit to be made, the people presiding over the matters will not think up with the matter, even if it is for the common good. And I am saying that we must also aggregate our views and even our resentment, you know, and we must find a way of harassing the members of the National Assembly to submission, to be able to do the things that we expect them to do. Now, of course, there is also the difficulty of the high mortality rate, you know, within the National Assembly. People come, people go, everybody wants to renew their mandate. The people who were there yesterday are gone, others are, are back in. They are learning the ropes. They are not adequately prepared for even understanding the dynamics and the rules of engagement. So we have this dilemma. But I think that this is where our political scientists, 
all, all those involved in social science and civil society must continue to draw lessons from other parts of the world that have already gone through this road before. There is no country that is, you know, that is having a democracy that has not experienced worse things than we have experienced. But people have learned lessons. So the issue of lawmaking, because it also speaks to the quality of law, lawmakers that we are that we are elected. It speaks to the quality of engagement that we have with the lawmakers. So again, this is really you are down to you know talking about how do you mount pressure on people after you've entrusted power to them. And I think the most important thing is for every Nigerian to remain cynical of a political actor, you know, of, for somebody holding trust on your behalf. We, we tend to hand the trust over to them and then go to sleep and hope that on the basis of their declared integrity, they will act on our behalf. It's not been the, you know, it's not, it's not been the case. So this constant engagement, that is why people like us, for example, um, I'm often labeled as a, as a political agitator, you know, but I'm happy with that level because we must continue to assault this bastion of injustice until it crumbles. Because until it crumbles, we are not a people. So dignity is not something that anybody can confer on you or take away from you. It is a human right. It is inalienable. It is a right conferred to you by God. And we are witnessing a country with so much resources that are being wasted by the day. You know, and yesterday's vote proves to be better than today because we just progress backwards. Oh, we get nostalgic about yesterday because, okay, they were not as crooked as these other people that we have now. And it really shouldn't be so. So and for me, the final word is to say it is the quality of media engagement. And I commend you, channels, Arise, AIT, all these television. These conversations are very important. The important thing is that they don't become something that we forget after we've left the studio. We must design mechanisms for constantly assaulting and engaging the state until politics becomes respectable. Get your thoughts on voter turnout. Uh, I was looking at the figures. So in a state of between 45 million people, population-wise, uh, registered voters, 2.2 million. But then you realize that just over 500,000 people actually turned out to vote. In essence, saying that about 1% or 10% rather of the population selected the leader uh, that will govern the affairs of the state for the next four years. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Looking at those figures, where is the issue here, really? Well, indeed, I mean, these elections, <laughs> let me just simply say it's COVID, and with COVID, nothing is normal. I'm sure a lot of people probably acted, you know, in, in, in the area of self-interest. And also don't forget, I think that there was a lot of thunder and people expected it to rain. So many people may not have metaphorically had enough umbrellas to go out there. They didn't want to take the risk of being, in the, you know, in the rain. Uh, uh, so we are mightily grateful to God about the, this, you know, this escalation. Of the, of the of the process of violence because people really were afraid um but the second point is that um again as i said it's not so much the numbers voter apathy is spreading across the world uh because people have other things to do and they, you know the politicians themselves may not have made politics sufficiently respectable so people are more enthusiastic to go and watch a football match than they would rather you know than going you know than going for an election uh but the point with Edo is that I think Edo is mightily lucky, and Edo owes Nigeria a lot because it has produced chairmen. You know, it has produced the most chairmen. There is no state that has produced the number of national chairmen that Edo has produced of political parties: Tommy Kimi, Tony Aneni, John Oyegun, uh, Adam Soshimole. You know, so they, they they ought to have developed you know a political culture. But to answer your question, I think that after you know during COVID outcomes are completely different. And I think that even the numbers that turned out, about 33% of, of those who were registered to vote, is sufficiently good enough. But you know, with elections, uh, this is why the process itself can punish people. Because it's not the number of people who registered to vote, it's not the population, the, it, it has 5 million people. But if it was a case that only 10,000 people turned out, those 10,000 people would be the ones to elect somebody who is going to govern you. So this is why it is imperative. You know, the elites tend to watch golf on Saturday, you know, instead of going out to vote. Um, or they send their talks, you know. But it also means that 
you are going to suffer the consequences of the quality of governance that you are going to get because the system is not based on the number, it's based on the number of people who turn out to cast their vote, not the number of people who are PBCs, not the, 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 the number of people who actually voted. And that is why rather than politicians running around pastors and, uh, and, uh, and imams seeking endorsement, they should be out there engaging the people. You know, encouraging people to go out and vote. And we, I think that the churches and civil society have also done very well in terms of mobilizing people. You know, but this is something that must continue as a process of engagement, not something that happens in the month of election. Because people need to, you know, be sufficiently convinced about the power of their vote and how significant and how important it is. But you see, part of the problem is that the ordinary people go out to vote. The politicians give appointments only to their friends who they import either from other states or from abroad. I'm not saying people who are in diaspora cannot, you know, cannot govern. But there is almost you know, something dysfunctional about political rewards after elections. Uh, and the, that politicians often, do, those who to use the word work hard, and that sometimes working hard is a metaphor for is either stealing votes or the amount of resources you deployed or the amount of toggery you are able to embark on. But I think that after elections, governors must also, and president must also spread the net so wide that somehow there are people in the system that you can also see. There's no need encouraging people with disability to go out and vote with all the difficulties. INEC has made provision for them, and they don't see themselves in the mirror of power. There's no need encouraging young people to go out to vote. If after they've cast their vote, they don't see their, 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 their reflection in the mirror of power. Why would you ask women to go out and vote? If at the end of the day, they don't see a reflection of themselves. And the best women can get is either commissioner for education or commissioner for, 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 for some, some nondescript office. So if you don't begin to enlist people, you will not be able to inspire confidence in their base. We need to anchor at this point. But just to add that uh, I think Kaduna declared just Wednesday as public holiday, not uh, three days. I think you might have said three days. But thank we do you. thank you for talking to us this morning. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then. We're back in a moment. Don't go away.